I can't really say that we've saved the best to last, as all our speakers over these two days have been fantastic, but let me say our next speaker is sure to be a highlight. Simon McKean is the 2011 Australian of the Year, a prominent investment banker and record-breaking yachtsman. But it's yet his efforts to support multiple Australian and international not-for-profit organisations which has earned him his greatest admiration. In 1994, in the midst of a, a successful corporate career, Simon decided that he, didn't, that he didn't want to put off serious engagement with the community sector until his most productive years were behind him. So he transitioned to a part-time role as executive chair of Macquarie Group's Melbourne office, enabling him to support a range of causes and organisations, including joining the board of World Vision Australia. As well as his many Australian of the Year activities, Simon is also currently chair of CSIRO and Business for the Millennium Development. He's also involved with the Global Poverty Project, and Red Dust Role Models, which works with remote Indigenous communities. Simon's selection as this year's Australian of the Year has given the community sector a unique opportunity in this most crucial of years for the Australian community sector. So to hear where he thinks what we need to do and where we may go, let's make Simon very welcome. Thank you. Thanks um, very much, Dennis. And look, can I just say I really am the bookend, aren't I? I'm right at the very end of uh, what I know has been a couple of amazing days. In fact, I know that because, uh, you know, there's a thing called Twitter nowadays and, and other stuff whereby you can actually be at a conference without needing to be, well, sorry, without actually physically being at the conference. And as a bookend, I also know that, um, you know, many of you must be saying, gee, I hope this guy really gets through his stuff quickly because, Actually, there's some music in three quarters of an hour or so when I'm finished. And uh, I hope that's still on. Oh, I came last night, did it? Yeah. Oh, sorry. So all you've got's me. Yeah. Is there anything else at all after? No, there's nothing else. You can sing a song. I'll sing a song later on. Well, I do apologise that you've only got me. And um, look, I have been um, having an extraordinary, you know, wild ride this year. Um, I want to make one point right up front, and that is that, um, uh, you know, I had this extraordinary honour early this year, and I do feel quite awkward about it. Awkward for a couple of reasons. The first is that if you look at the um, history of Australian of the Year, we're, we're the only nation in the world, would you believe, that has a, a government endorsed national citizen program, which I found extraordinary when I first heard about that a few months ago. Um, and we've had a history over 50 years. Uh, early on in the 60s, we actually chose Australians who didn't live in Australia. We, we chose people like uh, Dame Joan Sutherland or a, a great scientist, uh, McFarlane Burnett. But they lived overseas. They were doing their great work in their particular fields of endeavour a long way away from here. But we felt at that time of our revolution that it was important that we, um, I guess, salute people who were putting Australia on the map. We then went through a fairly long period where um, it was very much celebrity focused and or elite sportsman focused and uh, there was a period of time where, and I guess we're at the race course, for the, for the punters there was a better than evens chance if you were the uh, captain of the Australian Test cricket side you, you could be Australian of the Year at some stage during your tenure. Um, in recent years the pendulum swung again and uh, five of my six predecessors have been giants in a particular field of endeavour. They've all been professors and, um, uh, you know, frankly, have done extraordinary things. Patrick McGorry, of course, last year, raised the issue of mental health to heights we'd never seen in this country before. Before him, people like Ian Fraser, who found a, uh, a cure for uh, cervical cancer, Tim Flannery, Fiona Wood, you know, the list goes on and on of extraordinary giants in their particular field of endeavour. And then I come along. And, uh, you know, those of you who know me, and actually I can see a couple of faces who have had to put up with me talking over the last few months, so I apologise for that if you've heard some of this before. But, you know, I come along, and uh, I'm frankly not a giant in any particular field of endeavour. I sometimes bring some enthusiasm and passion for a cause, 
But whenever technically it gets tough, I know that there are people close by me, the, the giants in the sector who can come in and uh, do the heavy lifting, debate the cause, do whatever has to be said when the passion of a mere mortal runs out. But the other reason I'm actually feeling a bit awkward this year, you know, having been plucked out of, you know, just this extraordinary populace, 20 million people, many of whom are doing terrific things, is that, um, you know, never a day goes by where I'm not liaising with dealing with working side by side with people like you. Um, not necessarily well known, not necessarily nationally admired figures, although you ought to be, but people who have made extraordinary commitments, often on a much, much greater basis than I have, and uh, sacrificially so, and, and you know, supporting this great non-for-profit sector, this community sector. Um, and I feel awkward because I know that in my daily walk, coming aside, alongside these sort of people, I continually say, you know, it ought to be you, it ought to be you, it ought to be you. But it's actually been me, and if I dwell on it too long, I'll simply go mad. So I have, as my antidote, if you like, this opportunity this year to um, simply talk about a sector that I've grown to love and admire so greatly, and which I say time and time again has done so much me for me than uh, I've ever done for it. And uh, in particular, I do want to pay tribute to um, Dennis and uh, Carol Schwartz and all the others involved in our community. You know, I thought I knew a bit about this space, um, you know, over the years, but this year in particular has been an enormous year of learning for me. I think it was um, early this year that I actually went to our community's physical premises and was absolutely blown away by what this organisation is doing. It's current, it's relevant, it's uh, technologically savvy. If you don't know enough about our community, I suspect you know a lot because you're here, but if you don't know enough, find out more. It is absolutely, without any shadow of doubt, one of the real leaders in that important part of the non-for-profit space, namely connecting non-for-profits with the rest of the world. Supporters, corporates, givers, volunteers, whatever. And uh, it's a real privilege being here, albeit at the very end of the program, to send you all to sleep. But it is um, you know, wonderful to, to, to be here. Um, I just want to tell you, you know, one little story I've been trying every time I talk. And, and this year, the majority of my talking has not been to actually groups like you. It's been to, um, you know, often business people or uh, groups, senior management, politicians, um, I I indeed a wide variety of different groups because, you know, I am that jack of all trades. I'm not a, you know, interne intellectual giant in one particular field. So everyone thinks that I can say something sensible, which is, you know, a complete misnomer, I have to say. But I am talking to this wide variety of groups and I'm taking um, every opportunity, I guess, to very genuinely extol the virtues of the non-for-profit sector. The fact that it is a massive, massive sector. It's the, the pointy heads, the economists in Canberra measure it, measure you in the terms of tens upon tens upon tens of billions of dollars. And as you all know, um, life in this country without the community sector would be just so different. And I'm taking every opportunity to say that, you know, it's the community sector that does all the stuff that either people in business or people in government are ill-equipped or unable or unwilling to do. It catches all those people that um, fall between societal's cracks. And it's doing it largely just out of a response to that need. It's not doing it, obviously, on a profit-making uh, motivation, and you're not elected by the... Uh, by the populace. You're just simply seeing a need, you're attending to that need, you're playing to your strengths and doing all that unwanted stuff. And I'm taking every opportunity I can to remind people who have choices in their lives, whether it's choices as to how to spend their time or how to spend their money, that there is this huge sector which is nurturing the nation and which in turn needs nurturing uh, itself. And I have been taking uh, my opportunities to try and tell stories that actually um, might um, ignite some interest in, in a corporate or, or, or some uh, in the heart of some person that hitherto hasn't had any exposure to the non-for-profit sector. And it's great because, you know, I've been around for a while, I've got lots of stories. Um, and, you know, one that I'm just going to tell today, and I don't know why I'm telling it in that you've got hundreds yourselves, but I'm going to just pick out one organisation which, um, you know, has impressed me um, over the years, a um, uh, uh, really a, a, 
an organisation based here in Melbourne, in St Kilda, and it just basically works with um, heroin addicts. And uh, the reason I've been telling that story is that I thought that the way it um, tried to understand the mind of the corporate, tried to reach out to a, to a corporate, sometimes very large corporates, and say, look, we would like your help, but in quite an intelligent and creative way. It uh, firstly appreciated, well, let me go back a step, the particular program, and it was quite, uh, from a medical perspective, groundbreaking, was that uh, cold turkey in the world of heroin generally takes, um, you know, 10 days or so. It's a long period whereby the body is going through that gruesome adjustment process of weaning itself off the addiction to that drug. And of course, even after 10 or 11 days of cold turkey, it's not as if it's all gone. But the medical profession would say that's kind of most of it out of the way. That is a long period of time to, uh, to go without that drug once you've been addicted to it. And um, with the help of medical science, they basically created, a, uh, I guess, a, a way, a surgical implant, actually, whereby they'd put another little drug inside the stomach cavity, which concertinaed that heroin process from 10 days down to an absolutely awful 24 hours. But it meant that at the end of that 24 hours, um, you were actually where you would have been otherwise in 11 days' time, which was a better place, even though it was pretty grotesque. And um, the program that I was interested in, basically, uh, there are obviously primary carers around the particular addict who was undergoing this treatment, and they would be physically by their side, not always family members. A lot of these people don't have close family members, as you would know, but, um, you know, other friends, whatever, people that could be around. But uh, First Step also appreciated that there was... Um, a lot of good that could be done by what they called secondary carers. Interestingly, people who never physically met the person, but the contact would be over the phone. And it would be by arrangement between that secondary carer and the, um, and the heroin addict. And what was really interesting was that as First Step thought more and more about this, they said, you know, these secondary carers might actually be able to come from the busy world of just workers, you know, whether in business, professions, you know, whatever. Surely we've all got five or ten minutes or half an hour every now and then to, um, to speak to someone at the end of the phone with a real need just to reach out and connect with someone like us. And uh, the program typically would start off fairly intensively, like you'd be in touch with these people on a, on a daily or a two daily basis, and then gradually it would just wean off such that over three or four or five months it might get down to once a week, once a fortnight, and then Really, by mutual arrangement, there would be a parting of the ways, although I still keep up in touch with, uh, with one person every now and then. Nevertheless, the reason I found it amazing was, um, was twofold. Firstly, um, it, it was not so much tailored to you know, the, the corporate world, people like me who wear suits, but first step, I guess, had the, um, the ingenuity to try and tailor something that was absolutely right for the people that they were trying to help but equally absolutely right for people like um, many who work up and down Collins Street, who sometimes are hopeless at keeping appointments or uh, you know, making commitments to travel out to the suburbs or whatever. But you know, I challenge many people, surely there's got to be a few minutes in our day where we can just shut the rest of the world out and reach out to someone who desperately needs us efficiently by, by telephone. Secondly, the training was outstanding. Uh, we weren't going to go anywhere near the coal face of need there until we were subjected to um, you know, several evenings of uh, counselling training. And um, all I can say is that the counselling that that organisation arranged for us was absolutely second to none. Um, in fact, we came away from that counselling session, um, frankly, just uh, more mature, more grounded, in fact, better equipped to do a whole bunch of things in our lives, whether it's be parents or managers or whatever. And um, the program at the moment is a little bit on hold. The medical profession is having a good look at whether it is right to uh, continue these surgical implants. But I have to say that's the medical side of it. The counselling side of it worked really well. And, um, you know, I've taken, as I said, my opportunities this year just to tell stories about where when um, a non-for-profit really is, um, you know, creative, intelligent, tries to work something up which will work for the corporate community. Um, there was no shortage of uh, people putting up their hands and saying, yeah, I really, really want to be part of that. And a point I'll just make a little bit down the track also is that um, 
you know, it's sometimes so hard to get uh, dollars, cash, out of a uh, publicly held corporation. Our largest corporations in the land are publicly held, owned by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of shareholders. It's hard to get lots of cash out of those companies. I'll deal with that in a moment. But uh, when you can establish a relationship, the likes of which I just described, it's amazing how the cash tap just starts to turn on anyway, because once the relationship is established, people open their eyes up. Uh, certainly I've seen firsthand people in my organisation saying, and becoming indeed great advocates for the organisation, they couldn't believe the effectiveness of the work. Sure, they saw it, warts and all. Not everything is perfect. Some things don't work out at, well, uh, at all well. Some addicts didn't last more than two days. There are always a little admin stuff ups and what have you, but that's the real world, isn't it? Including from BHP down. But the point is that they saw the extraordinary work that was being done firsthand. It became infectious. And funnily enough, whilst it wasn't the first reason that they became involved, wallets came out, other people were involved, the cash flowed anyway. I think the, um, the corporate sector is at a very interesting stage. And I want to be careful not to overgeneralise or, or gild lilies, because um, you know, there's a long, long way to go in what I want to say. But um, you know, when I'm talking to corporate chiefs and what have you, I say, look, the corporate sector does do a whole lot of good stuff. It, it provides goods and services at uh, hopefully competitive prices, increasing quality. It provides the bulk of our employment in the Western world. It provides or it underpins a whole taxation system which allows government to operate. Indeed, looking at the, the world globally, you know, commerce has lifted more people out of uh, abject poverty in the last 20 years than all the combined efforts of multilateral programs or all the aid agencies combined. But having said all that, every survey I've ever read about um, the community's attitude generally to business has, um, at the end of the day, treated it with a certain amount of derision. And I think there's a uh, reason for that. The fact is that um, so often business appears to be putting its hand out. It, it is so focused, as it has to be, on uh, profit maximising, earning a return on the capital that's been invested. Uh, it's actually the law of the land. The corporation's law requires every company in this land to maximise profit. They are not non-for-profits and uh, I'm not embarrassed about that. That's the way it is. Um, but I guess it goes beyond that because business has, I think, a hopeless reputation of presenting itself as being far too self-interested. It's on the, the grab for a better taxation system suited to itself. It's looking for a an industrial relations regime that uh, suits its particular purposes. There's um, no end of reporting, um, probably once or twice a year at annual report time, the very high salaries that are paid to uh, senior people in business. And some people in the community sector would say, and it's worse than that because as a rule of thumb, you won't see this written down terribly much anywhere, but as a rule of thumb, um, it's very hard for these publicly listed companies to donate more than one or two percent of their net profit after tax by way of cash donation. And, um, uh, you know, that's the reality. I actually don't lose any sleep over that because I think that there are areas where there's a whole lot of other low hanging fruit. But the fact is that um, if they do end up giving more than one or two percent of cash uh, by way of cash of that profit, they start getting beaten up, the boards get beaten up by um, everyone from large institutions to the Australian Shareholders Association. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're just saying, look, you, you're misguided, you, you're actually um, losing your way, we'll vote you out of office or, or whatever. And um, we're not alone here in Australia, that's pretty much a rule of thumb right around the world. However, I mentioned um, some low hanging fruit. And the point is that um, just try, well, perhaps going back a minute or two to that first step example. The fact is that um, the, the corporations that I'm aware of from inside anxiously want to be more today, particularly driven by Gen Y and Gen Z, than, uh, than simply you know, money-making machines. I'm having a really interesting year in that um, you know, I'm sort of out most nights, and particularly if I'm in Melbourne, I might go back to my office at about 10 o'clock to uh, you know, pick up the bag and turn the email off or, or whatever. The people in my office at that late hour are, uh, are people in their 20s. 
Um, they're not actually people in their later 30s or indeed 40s. They've got families. They'll probably be working at home perhaps later on. But, you know, the reality is that they're not there. It's, it's really seriously Gen Y verging on Gen Z. And I come back to the office uh, later on. I don't really mean to spend a lot of time there, but they'll buttonhole me and uh, they are fearless in expressing to me what they think the vibe of the organisation ought to be. Now, when I was 25 years old, I wouldn't have ever dreamt of having the courage to, uh, to say that to, 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 to my boss. It would have been certainly career limiting. But I'm seeing a new generation come through who actually are quite fearless. They know that if I take a dim view on their thoughts as to what they think the corporation ought to be all about um, and, and give them a black mark, <laughs> they'll be gone in a flash. And they, you know, the, the, the best and brightest coming through know that they can get five other offers somewhere else in quick time. Um, it's actually even worse than that again, because as they leave, not being impressed about the vibe of the organisation internally, they'll tweet and Twitter and everything else on the way out so that the entire world knows about it shortly. And, uh, you know, two or three years ago I used to say that and, um, you know, people in business treated that with some scepticism, but I've actually got a couple of examples now where even in the interview process, big business trying to get the best and brightest graduates out of our, our universities. And, and uh, let me tell you today, it's the graduates that interview the employers. And I think it's a good thing. And if the employers aren't, you know, standing up to it and uh, presenting a corporate that, that really does have a decent vibe in sight, offering these people more than just, um, you know, a weekly pay packet and a, a long corporate ladder up which to rise, um, the whole graduate world knows about it fairly shortly. And uh, indeed, there's a celebrated, which I won't name the organisation, it's one of our competitors, but a celebrated case just two or three years ago where they clearly put the wrong interviewer in and uh, a complete day went by and this fellow just interviewed everyone and um, it, was, it was hopeless you know he just basically said you know if you don't get what we're on about then we're going to treat you like this and what have you um, they got no serious graduates of um, you know any calibre in that entire year and suffice to say that fellow wasn't on the interview panel next year so I think the world is changing. I don't want to generalise or gild the lily though. It's not changing rapidly. But there is a new um, type of employee and typically they are amongst the best of the best who are demanding more of their, um, of their corporations. I think it's actually happening much more funnily enough in the US, which economically is doing it tougher than us here. But um, it's actually best described, I think, by a fellow called Professor Michael Porter, arguably, arguably the the world's most renowned business academic based in Harvard. And he's talking about a concept called shared value. And uh, going back to that point I was making before about um, the corporate world being derided by the community at large, he would say, look, another reason for that derision is that, um, you know, we have some major, major problems in the world. No surprise about that. We've always had problems. But the corporations who are... Um, are going to be making it in the future, the corporations that really will rise to the surface in the future, are those that want to appear as part of the solution, not, you know, observing off the side and just pointing out all the problems. And I've got to say again, that's what I'm seeing in the new generation coming through. They want to be part of the solution as well, and they want to put the corporate resources that they see every day of the week around them to good effect. Um, the world's largest industrial conglomerate is, uh, is General Electric, GE. And the CEO of GE was out here just a few weeks ago. I spent a bit of time with him because they have a close collaborative agreement with uh, CSIRO. And I heard him give a couple of talks like I am now, and, and I heard him say things that I've never heard any other Australian CEO or, uh, say, in fact, or certainly using quite the same language. But for example, something that's topical this week is um, uh, carbon and alternative energy. And, you know, here's this guy that is the CEO of the world's largest industrial conglomerate. And he said, uh, and I won't try and emulate his American accent, but, but he said, look, it's just inevitable that there's going to be a price on carbon in one way, shape or form in every developed country in the world. He said, I don't know exactly whether it's going to be a carbon tax or an ETS or whatever, and I don't know what the time frame is, but 
you know, you'd, you'd be bonkers if you didn't expect, and, 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 you know, he was saying our firm corporate view in GE is that will be the case. Secondly, that will lead to uh, the need to, um, on a much larger scale than we have today, produce ways of generating alternative energy. And he said, look, again, we don't know at GE, we're not that clever enough to actually work out which particular pieces of technology are going to uh, ultimately, uh, you know, dominate or be more competitive than others. But he said, so we're backing everything. And the sorts of money they're investing is quite significant. And all I'm saying is that uh, he spoke openly about this. Um, uh, you know, he got all sorts of people asking him hard questions because, you know, he was straying into, obviously, sensitive political areas, but he had no issues at all. He, uh, he was happy to take on anyone that, uh, that defied him. He was basing his views on science, on logic. Everything takes a bit of time. Even the tobacco lobby finally got, you know, worn down after decades of, uh, of lying to the community. Uh, he said, I don't know the time frame, but the reality is that one day we'll have a huge alternative energy industry, and it's my job that GE is at the forefront of that, and it is being pushed by junior people in the organisation. Um, I think over time we'll see more Australian CEOs sort of become a bit more enlightened and, um, and be able to talk with the sort of courage and uh, uh, insight that, that um, people like Geoffrey Imelt do. And as I said, it's being pushed by employees within the organisation. It's certainly being pushed by uh, a much more discerning community, um, uh, sorry, a discerning consuming public. So the question is, what do we do about all of that from a non-for-profit perspective? Um, I think the trend is kind of right, but you will all have your own stories of how it's two steps forward, one step back, or possibly even one step forward and two steps back. Um, you know, you will each have your own stories about, nevertheless, how difficult it can be to engage with the, um, with the corporate world. And incidentally, I'm not going to speak today, although if you wanted me for another hour, which I'm sure you don't, I'd love to talk about another area again, which I really hope is going to open up so much in the future, and that's simply going beyond the corporate world into the world of the high net worth individual the people with wealth, the people that um, at this point in time are not really sharing it in a huge way in Australia. Uh, we have a long, long way to go before we're even close to what happens in the, um, in the US. But that's perhaps another topic for another time. Today it's really just about engaging with the corporate world. How do we do that? I think the first thing is that um, some of my closest friends are in the non-for-profit sector and detest the corporate world, and they do it with a passion, they distrust it, they're my friends, and sometimes I say, I don't want to change your attitude, because they're so passionate in what they're doing, I'm not going to convert them when they're at uh, you know, their particular stage of life, and you know what, it doesn't matter, because they're doing fabulous work. All I say is don't put them on the front line in trying to engage with the corporate sector. <laughs> and I mean, thanks for laughing, but it does happen. It really does happen, I've seen it with, you know, myself, and that's okay, but we're all wired differently. I wouldn't in any way want to take those people out of the space, they're fabulous. It's just that they have a role to do, it won't be engaging with the, the corporate sector. We have our big tribes, don't we? Um, corporate tribes, the community tribe, government tribe, and we do have different languages, and it's so important in the, in the community sector to not only, you know, train, and, and, uh, and encourage people to be good communicators with the corporate sector, but most importantly, to remind them that their job is really, really important. Um, uh, you know, it might be seen as kind of cheap marketing or just selling the organisation, whatever. I think actually it's just one of the many, many skills that is required in any non-for-profit organisation to make it, you know, a really, really good team effort. I think the second thing is, um, have a really good look around today at how well served we are in the community sector by what I call the intermediary organisations, organisations like our community. And there are others as well. They do slightly different things and it's not one size fits all. Make sure you're uh, you know, dealing with the one that's best suited for helping you. But whether it's uh, good company, volunteering Australia, great connections, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think in a relatively short period of time, really, these organisations are increasing their, uh, their value, um, their own skill base, 
um, they can be of considerable assistance to, um, to making a real change in the non-for-profit sector. Um, and I guess really drawing upon the little anecdote I gave from First Step, um, you know, think creatively about what the corporate is really looking for. Um, you know, how many times have, have the old stories been told about, um, you know, walls just being painted ten times in, in, in two years simply to, you know, engage in some way with, with a group of volunteers or a corporate? Well, you know, those days are, 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 are absolutely gone. Um, you know, a corporate does want to do something relevant. Corporate wants to do something that's playing to its strengths, playing to its employees' strengths, um, and, and every corporate in the land has all sorts of departments, whether it's a marketing department, an IT department, and they're typically built to withstand peak loads during the year. Um, you know, one of my greatest joys was seeing um, the IT department at Macquarie just at a slightly less busy time of the year do a, a wonderful job upgrading the IT system at um, that organisation that was mentioned earlier, Red Dust Role Models. Everyone was a winner. The system actually even worked, which is surprising because it doesn't work at work sometimes. Um, but, you know, Red Dust was, was really pleased when that, when that happened. And um, all I'm saying is that, you know, intelligently let's approach the corporate community. And I have to say that going back to that 1% of net profit after tax rule, rule of thumb, there are no rules of thumb in relation to this area that I'm talking about now. Um, I'm not talking about hiding things from shareholders or from, uh, you know, ASIC or whatever, but the reality is that um, big corporate organisations are just groups of people, groups of people just uh, producing goods or services, making a profit, but they're individuals just like you, and many of them have hearts um, who are interested in making a change, and they know best how to use whatever resources have been built up over often decades in the corporate to best use both inside the corporate and outside um, as well. Um, and you know, whether it's marketing departments or just providing strategy, of course, all of you need good people on your boards. Um, you know, I really do think that um, uh, you know, the more you engage with the corporate, as I said earlier, the more, and I know what you really need is cash, I know that's what you really, really need, but often the cash just flows when you're able to, um, you know, in an intelligent way, integrate people into your, um, into your business. I just want to um, close by going back to First Step because um, there was one particular relationship that, that I had, um, you know, just a guy at the end of a phone and uh, I don't think I've ever had this before, but you know, initially his journey started off um, very well, you know, very, very positively. And then um, to this day, I don't really know, but something else must have happened in his life because in a relatively short period of time, he started to go on a, uh, on a real downer again. And um, he was probably, I don't know, the fourth or fifth person that I'd had. And you know, the previous ones had been, I won't say, um, formulaic, but it had been relatively straightforward. You know, in fact, we'd got through to the end and I actually don't know today whether they use or what, but, you know, the program seemed to, at my superficial level of contact, you know, seemed to work very well. But this guy suddenly took a big dive and um, at, at, at one point I can recall being, um, uh, I thought it was just going to be a five or ten minute call with him and I actually... Uh, probably quite wrongly timed it to be, you know, sort of 15 minutes before a really important meeting that I was supposed to be in. And it was wrong on my part because I kind of knew from one or two calls beforehand that he was starting to, you know, end up in a place that wasn't very good. Anyway, this particular call, um, you know, he was in a really, really bad place. He was crying out for help clearly and, um, you know, he was threatening to take his, his life. and. Um, a couple of things happened. Firstly, you know, it didn't end up being a 10 minute call. I used every little bit of knowledge that I'd got from that wonderful training course. I mean, I'm not going to pretend to you that I'm a trained counsellor, but at least I had, you know, these six or seven fabulous sessions, um, which taught me so much. And obviously I was using every little bit of that that I could and also working out, you know, how do I refer him on? How do I really put him in the hands of people that can, um, you know, can make, uh, 
well, a really important difference at this critical time of his life. And, um, and of course, the fact that I had a big meeting in 10 or 15 minutes became very, very secondary, and uh, the phone call probably went on for three quarters of an hour. As you know, dealing with people with mental health, it sort of went round and round in circles. I thought I'd achieved something, and then we'd go back to the start again, and, and it just went on and on and on, and three quarters of an hour went by. Um, but towards the end, uh, for reasons I still don't understand today, he said, um, and it came out of the blue, it wasn't actually anything I said, it was just, I guess, that I was at the end of the phone, um, not so much pleading with him, but just hoping that he would make a good decision. But all of a sudden, out of the blue, he said, oh, thank you, Simon, I'm feeling, I am feeling better now. And I can just, as I say it now, I can hear him say those words, because it had been 40 minutes of absolute uncertainty leading up to that. and I. I said, look, that's really, really great. Um, you know, I think it really is time for you now to wander down and meet those people at first step again. You will do that, won't you? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm feeling, feeling better. Um, why am I finishing on that note? Because uh, I was very late for this really, really important meeting and I <laughs> grabbed my bag and I, and I rushed in. I think I looked really flushed and, um, you know, different, if you like. And uh, this... Um, this meeting, it was actually, you know, one of Melbourne's biggest companies, a big board, and I walked in and, and I just wanted to get into the meeting straight away. I didn't want to talk about what had held me up. And the chairman was a wonderful fellow and he said, Simon, you know, take your time, it's all right. We've got time for you to sit down, have a glass of water or whatever. And he said, uh, what's been happening? And I said um, to myself, well, do I just say I got caught up in something or do I tell him the story? And I looked at them and for five seconds I said, damn it, they can share with me what, just, you know, what I've just been through. Um, and I'm really glad I did. Because to a man and a woman, and it probably took me five or ten minutes to recount the story, but to a man and a woman around that table they said, thank you. This is a really big corporation. They said, frankly, we've made some really big decisions about the future of this company today but we probably haven't had a more profound five or ten minutes in the day than that. And they were very genuine. Then we had to go on and deal with what I was supposed to be there for in the first place. But all I can say is that, um, you know, don't ever, ever give up hope about trying to bring these two great sectors together. It won't happen in the way that we predict, but it will happen if, um, if we reach out to each other. Let me tell you, the corporate sector, I think, the individuals in it, need you actually more than you need them. Um, there are many, many busy, well they think they're busy people, we think we're busy people, but in many respects there's often a big part of our life that's, that's missing, namely a direct connection with people seriously in need and a hope of, on a totally voluntary basis, making a, a difference. And uh, never give up hope. Every now and then you'll get a door shut in your face or someone will say something disrespectful from the corporate community, but please don't give up. I think the trend is good, it's not fast enough, but if we use our minds intelligently and our passion, we will make progress. Thank you.